I think that competition in our business really has grown substantially, really across the whole nation. I mean, What's up, everybody? We have an amazing episode and a very quick episode today, uh, as is the New York way with our guest that's from Brooklyn, New York. But before we get into his background and bio, Dan, how are you doing? Great. It was uh, fun talking to Chris today, uh, having just been in New York City and got a taste of what's going on there. I was excited to interview someone doing business there because there's so few people on podcast here what goes on in day-to-day new development and, and sales in New York City real estate. Absolutely. And it shows the power of networking with this particular interview. Chris and I actually met a year or two ago via LinkedIn, and Dan and I did a trip to New York and Philadelphia recently, and I was able to get together with him in person and get him on the podcast. But Our guest today is Christopher Calabrese, and he began his career in real estate brokerage in Brooklyn, New York in 2013, and quickly realized his passion for the many facets within the real estate industry. Since founding the CS organization in 2016, Chris has expanded the firm's capability to include three verticals, which are boutique real estate brokerage, capital advisory, and the strategic pursuit of multifamily development in focused markets of New York City which that's exactly what Dan mentioned. Uh, New York scares a lot of people from a business perspective, but we go into a little bit of the opportunities and challenges of doing business in the city, as well as why it's important to potentially pivot to other markets as well. So without further ado, let's bring in Chris. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Excellent. How are you guys doing? Doing, doing great. Chris, well, it was a pleasure getting to meet you in person uh, just a few weeks ago whenever I was in New York. Uh, I know Dan and you didn't quite get to connect just because of timelines, but if you could just share with the audience a little bit about yourself and when you got started in real estate and how you got started in real estate. Absolutely. I've been in real estate my whole life, 11 years professionally, my family for about 50, uh, uh, handling every aspect of the business from management to brokerage to development. We've kind of seen, you know, multiple cycles and and different uh, different attributes of each market cycle here in uh, in the Brooklyn area mostly. That's great. And you founded the CS organization, which uh, I've been looking at your website. Can you tell us a little bit about all of the services that you offer and just a general thirty thousand foot view, and then we'll we'll jump into uh, some more specifics of the operations and deals that you guys are doing every day. Absolutely, the CS organization is a boutique uh, real estate firm. We do capital advisory, investment sales, and development. Um, we have a unique kind of approach because we wear a a principal hat. So our brokerage capacity got is is definitely benefiting from that um, approach. And I think our clients appreciate that as well. We're able to steer them uh, better and and have a little more experience as if we're in their shoes. Sure. No, that that makes sense. And development, there's a lot of different things you're working on. But one of the biggest things that I think Mason and I wanted to touch on is just doing business in New York City. You know, he and myself do a lot of business out west. There's endless land available you know, down in the Southeast, endless land available, very easy regulation wise, Colorado somewhere in the middle, but nothing like New York City. And a lot of people stay away from New York because of that. Obviously, it's some of the most desirable real estate in the country. So can you tell us a little bit about operating in New York City? Is it worth it? You know, are the fears overstated? You know, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, in my, in my opinion, in my observation of my professional time here, I'm going to speak only to mine because I think my eyes are kind of, um, easier to describe versus others. Uh, so I've seen, I've seen the market in 2015, 2016, the 2017 explode here in New York, the sales market. Uh, transactional volume was through the roof, um, even up to 18. And things were moving very quickly. Deals were getting done. There was always challenges associated with political 
you know, changes and minor issues and hurdles that the city has put in front of developers and operators. But one of the biggest things that I saw, and I was lucky and unlucky in a sense, but lucky to see was I was able to see the, the 2019 rent stabilization laws change. And that, you know, that uh, legislation basically crippled the multifamily six plus unit uh, product. I mean, you know, completely uh, took values down. Transactional volume went, yeah, we went down very quickly. Um, and we're seeing the after effects now. We're seeing rising costs for multifamily owners and we're seeing stagnation in those rent stabilization buildings where they're having issues with increases because they're capped and they can't recoup fast enough. The cost is rising and the rents are staying, you know, at a level that is, uh, is just not feasible. So now we have sellers selling, you know, on a price per brick that they would never assume, you know, and and also cap rates. When we used to see cap rates before 2019, cap rates would be, you know, in line with the rest of the building. To call it, uh, you know, a range from like four and a half to five and a half. Now we're seeing cap rates in 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 I would say a, a more of a blanket market, not by sub market, um, in Brooklyn, above a six, above a six and a half. I've even seen deals trade closer to eight percent cap rate, which is like, we, I've never thought in my career that I would see that type of cap rate here, but that's, you're buying a bond essentially. And there's not much, you know, value, you know, add in these deals. Interesting. So can you uh, specify what exactly that law entails? You know, is it just a form of rent control where you can only increase 3% a year or something like that? And then kind of as a corollary to that, What's the strategy? How are people adapting to still make multifamily worth buying? Or is it simply price readjustment that is making multifamily worth buying? Uh, tell us a little bit about that. I think it's a mix. Just to answer the first question, what changed? Capital improvement, um, they basically capped. So you could put a ton of money in a unit and you're capped on the rent increases. Um, eviction. And and basically changes in the laws of how to handle evictions, crippling uh, of the status, basically. So that, in coupled with the escalation caps and a plethora of details that I will be here all day if we got to, uh, uh, basically put that dampener on. Now, what I'm seeing and what we've seen, you know, from 2019 is we're seeing generational ownership, the mom and pops, still holding on, still holding on to these buildings. And we have a few that we know very well that we've kind of been tracking them and listening to them like a psychologist through the years. You know, we're going on five years now of, of listening to this type of stuff. But basically, they're, you know, I think that a lot of these mom and pop individual owners are kind of waiting for, well, you know, maybe the law changes and we get back something that we could hang our hat on. And 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 that's possible. Um, but I think they're still stuck on valuations from prior to 2019. So selling is like not an option for them. And what we're trying to do is tell them, look, you know, obviously everybody's got their own investment parameters, goals, and objectives. But at the end of the day, if you got money trapped in an asset that's you know, not really making you a good return. There's nothing wrong with selling and whatever the price may be, reinvesting that capital and going into a growth position. So that's the conversation that we're having lightly. Uh, I think that this has been challenging to stomach the prices, you know, as a whole number these days. Because they're not looking at the yield like we are. They're looking at, what well, my, you know, my building was worth to me. Why is it worth $1 million? You know? Oh yeah, and it, that it's such an uncomfortable conversation to have sometimes because for you it's that it's just practical, it's just business, it's just numbers. And you mentioned being a psychologist for some of these people and hearing it, um, 
Dan and I talk a lot about how long it takes to sometimes nurture a lead before it's actually going to turn into a deal. And it, it's some of these leads that with the law changes in 2019 that you might have established relationships five plus years ago that you're going to keep talking to them about it. But with that being said, um, I see on your website you're interested in development deals in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. So talk to me, and and it says uh, units 3 to 30, luxury rental, condo. How do those deals pencil out compared to the existing structures? Um, are you looking for just significant value add? Are you looking to do vertical ground up construction on it? And how do you analyze a development deal as it comes into your organization? Absolutely. Um, we look for ground up deals mostly. Uh, and our historical track record has been ground up, I would say, almost 100%. Um, with the exception of a few conversions and whatnot. Um, I think that today, penciling a deal on a ground up is never the more difficult. It's easier to do a conversion, in my opinion, to be able to make the returns you need to make. But that being said, New York is the most competitive real estate market in the world. Is I mean, I believe, and let's analytics could, could show me different, but everybody's after the same thing. And to your point, Mason, you asked about uh, you know the market with the multifamily. What you know, what's happening? Well, what's happening is the people that were buying the six unit to 20, 30 units because of the rest stabilization laws have now started buying. We see institution, you know, like institutional uh, investment fund buying two to fours mm. and five units, which is like, you know, I would never see that coming, but this is what's happening. So now the two to four space, which was typical, you know, guys like, like us, mom and pop investor. Yeah. Are, are buying it up. So now the, the, the cap rate suppression on the rental portfolios of those is real. And the reality is the prices are just drastically going up and there's no inventory. Oh, yeah. Well, I tried the guy, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we've kind of seen that at a macro level a little bit with just more of the institutional people coming in and buying single family homes throughout the country, which they've always been doing it. But it's made the news a little bit more recently. But related to the inventory constraints and the constraints that you have with all these rent stabilization laws, does ground up construction, does it solve for that because there aren't established uh, rents within these places? Are you able to come in and say, hey, you know, we just built a 24 unit complex. This is what rents are. I don't have to base that on anything, um, or are there a certain amount of units within a vertical construction that you have to say, this is fixed at this lower rate, and then the rest, I can kind of establish whatever I want, or how does it work specifically with ground up? Yeah. So, I mean, right now the rental market, since the expiration of the tax abatement, uh, has been on hold and new building, uh, like application, the permits have tumbled. Uh, to make a deal work uh, as a rental has never been more difficult. They just passed a new uh, bill, uh, 45X. It lends credence, I think, to some of the... It's a, it's a wide range, but essentially to, I believe, a certain level and scale of units. I don't think it makes sense for every project size. Like, you know, the 1 to 50 is going to be completely different from the 100 plus. So it, it, it's just, it's really an operator's standpoint. You know, if you're if you're really handling all the aspects of the deal, you may be able to be more competitive. But I think rentals have never been so difficult. And what we're looking at really right now is, is condo. Because I think that, you know, there's still some delta there to solve for. Interesting. Okay. So... There's a point I wanted to emphasize there with the the small multifamily, you know, even given the law, that created more opportunity elsewhere, right? If you owned two to four unit buildings, you saw those appreciate and those are now going up. And so I just want to highlight that, you know, I'm sitting in La Jolla right now in California, you know, this part of California or Southern California has some of the harshest laws along with New York City, but people are still making money here every day. So when these laws come out, you know, instead of just complaining, I always kind of 
look towards, well, what's the opportunity? What's the, what's the solution? Um, so Chris, I, I want to get to Florida, but I've got to ask a couple more questions about this with the new development you and your family are looking for in Brooklyn those have got to be all scrapes, right? Or are there lots left that it, that are or houses that burn down? Or what does that look like? Sure. Yeah, it's all demolition jobs. There's no, just, there's very little to zero lots completely vacant sitting uh, here in the boroughs, especially in Brooklyn, which historically I think has outperformed every other borough. Um, I don't, I don't see that. Everything that, we've been involved in and, and even the opportunities we've been looking at, you know, they, they got call it a one to four unit house on a, on a larger piece with the right zoning. And you got to factor in, you know, demolition and, and site clearing, you know, but that's, yeah, I mean, very rare to find something, uh, you know, completely just shovel ready. Unless, unless you find something shovel ready that a developer, you know, entitled and basically got approved. But again, you're paying for that. In the end as well. Gotcha. Now, if you're taking one of those old, you know, say an old duplex that you're going to scrape and put more units on or just build a, a nice new one, what does that look like as far as budgeting for the demolition, getting it entitled, you know, both in time frame and cost? I have to imagine that the soft costs you've put into these projects before even you know, starting to scrape are, are pretty substantial, both in time and, and actual money. Can you walk us through maybe an example or high or low level, whatever you want? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm, yeah. Yeah. The cost definitely varies. It's, I mean, you know, definitely to the rest of the, of the markets across the country, it's definitely high cost in this time period. Um, the, the time frame. Is also very, you know, unless you're able to be creative, you're looking at a year to be able to get through the planning and process and all this. So you're talking about a, you know, two and a half to three year timeline to completion from from the beginning. Well, I I think that kind of allows us to transition a little bit to Florida and how my guess is your group as well as investors in New York are excited to invest in opportunities in Florida where you can potentially start construction and there's plenty of vacant land available always. So talk to us a little bit about the strategy with, I know, I know you're licensed in Florida as well. And I think you're doing some deals down there of what made you decide to pursue that market particularly. And what are you guys doing down there? So in 2000, let's see, 2019, I took a trip down to Florida on a deal that I got across my desk that really intrigued me and um we went down and did some some real homework on the market i saw some good opportunities uh prior to covid and we pursued a few of them mostly as a joint venture uh fashion we had a development partner down there still do um who has a track record of facilitating these type of deals and we were looking for rental mixed use deals. Um, what happened with 2020 hit is mind boggling because again, my timing was good that I was able to kind of see the, see the writing on the wall when even before COVID 2019, when things were heating up down there without the COVID influx and everything else, the rents were trending upward uh, substantially. The, the amount of buildings that were down there, you know, in construction and, you know, uh, new applications were also crazy. They also, you know, before the whole COVID uh, era, there was a lot of inventory left in the in the brick market. Condo inventory in South Florida was, was a little bit of a problem. Uh, COVID happens, everything changes. Prices go to the moon. Uh, residential, commercial, you name it, everything went to the moon. You know, I think this influx of economic um, uh, drivers, the infrastructure with the local politics, the social distancing kind of non-existency, all of these factors, you know, kind of drew in so many different types of 
people, investments, companies, that it just fueled what was already happening and also leveled out an inventory problem. And again, I'm not speaking from analytics. I'm just speaking from my my perception of the market and the network that I built down there in our conversations. No, it makes makes a lot of sense. And I think um, it just shows the the need and opportunity that uh, the need to pivot sometimes and the opportunities that if you take a look at a deal that comes across your desk of, oh, never necessarily would have thought about that. I mean, Dan and I, uh, we've done deals in Alabama and Pennsylvania, which I know the Sun Belt's on fire, but never would have thought to do a deal in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, except for the fact that it came across our desk. And uh, that's the beauty of this business and the networking that you're, you know, doing constantly. But uh, I know that you also, within the CS organization, you're doing capital advisory services. Um, you and I chatted about a deal that you did actually out in Colorado um, that I thought was a, a pretty interesting one. Um, but beyond getting into the specifics of the deal by deal, what are the capital advisory services uh, that you guys are offering? And kind of just tell us about the structure of that, because you've got this unique boutique for- firm that does a handful of different things. So for a deal that you come in and provide capital advisory services, where does the money come from? Where does it go? How are How's everyone paid in the transaction? How does it work? Sure. We have some lending relationships that we have uh, built over the years. Um made up of family offices, debt funds, banks, credit unions, et cetera. And we maintain those relationships strongly. And uh, as far as the capital advisory, what we do, we arrange um, uh, a bridge loan um, and different type of products for investment and development, mostly on the opportunistic side of the deals. So, Sponsors and developers looking to do conversion, ground up construction, even like a takeout scenario is more or less what we're doing. Got it. Got it. And I, I asked selfishly because, uh, you know, whenever we uh, we were having a drink, I shared a little bit about one of the projects in Colorado that's kind of similar to the one um, you guys participated in where uh, we're looking to take it over the take it over the final hump with the final amount of construction. So it's it it's just cool to see this group that you are operating that has all of these different tailored solutions for the client. Um, and before I pass it off to Dan, um, uh, just because I missed it by one day, uh, I know you've started doing events for the CS organization. Um, talk a little bit about how that recent event went who was there, what you guys were talking about, the beneficial relationships that everyone was able to create in that environment. Yes, and I was so sad that you were not there, but that's okay because the next one, you're both going to be there. There we go. <laughs> uh, I've never done an event, uh, a real estate event. Uh, you know, I've, I've been to many since I was a, basically a teenager. Um, and I wanted to do an event that encompassed really great people and not the typical people that you would see at these events where they're like just getting started in the business and they're looking to, you know, get an idea. So what we did, we put together a, a rock star uh, invitation list and everybody in that room was was, uh, was definitely somebody of magnitude. Um, the speakers were great. They came from all different backgrounds uh, relevant to all the stuff going on that we just talked about and beyond. And we had a great deal of people there. And poor Sonosa had a beautiful space for us. Got a relationship with them for some time. And it just, it came together great. I was very pleased. There's some things, of course, you know, being as my first event that I would do better next time that I, you know, maybe didn't think of. But I was, I was definitely pleased and, and happy about it. And I think that events like this, you know, like in a city full of so many events, I'm trying to stand out and I want to try to, I want to try to grow this as part of our community, you know, engagement and doing bigger and better things. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I have hosted a group in Colorado for years that's been very, very uh, worthwhile. You know, Mason and I went to one in Philadelphia where we made some solid contacts. 
Uh, so I mm-hmm. highly rec- recommend continuing that. But Chris, I, I had a follow up on what we were talking about there with New York versus Florida and the difference in the laws where it's kind of there's a yin and a yang to it where you mentioned, OK, if you want to go scrape a building in Brooklyn and do a new development deal, it might take three years. And that sucks. However, the advantage to that is there's a high barrier to entry. And it's not easy for new people to come in and compete with you, right? There's a bit of a moat around your business model. Whereas, you know, down a lot of these Florida markets where I'm doing business, there are endless finished lots available. Anyone can go and and put up a new construction home or duplex or small apartment pretty darn easily. And so how do you think about balancing? And and I guess I don't know if you're buying and holding down in Florida or, or building and holding or just making money, but how do you think about balancing markets like New York City with as high as a barrier to entry as possible, but huge pain in the ass factor with these, you know, very easy markets, but very easy for people to come in and compete with you? You know, how, how do you think about that? Well, I, you know, I think that it's, I think that both of the markets are extremely tough. Even, even now, you could say the Central Florida is a competitive market, Orlando. And then the MSA there. So I think that competition in our business really has grown substantially, really across the whole nation. I mean, I think that with these, with social media and real estate being the sexy, trendy thing to do these days, um, it's happening more and more. And I think that the competition, you know, the makeup of that competition is definitely different where we have the guys that have been doing it. We have the institutional guys. Then we have the young guys like us that, that you know, that done a few and have an idea. And then there's these people that come from the internet, the internet gurus, the internet students. And they're, they're you know, they're trying to figure it out. And, I, and I'm sure, and I've seen many of them do very well. And I think there's a lot of factors there. But then we've also heard and see others that are not doing so well. And if we look at, I was looking at a report earlier in the week where the distress rates on commercial real estate, the number two distressed asset right now outside of office, believe it or not, is multifamily, which we always felt was one of the strongest, you know, and well positioned asset classes. I think that these these commercial loans that were uh, uh, originated back in 21, 2021 are starting to catch up. And, and that's what this report I was reading from the Commercial Observer was basically, you know, uh, highlighting. And I think that that influx of, of competition that we're talking about here has a lot to do with, with that. Sure, sure. There's a lot of follow-up points and questions I have there. Uh, but it, it's interesting, at least in my world, and I, I think I can speak a little bit here for Mason too, it has calmed down a bit from two or three years ago with new people trying to get in, you know, like at my meetup used to be three new wholesalers that would show up every week. And that's kind of stopped. You know, the, the herd has been called to some degree. Um, and it's just interesting with what you brought up about uh, multifamily being distressed because everyone's been expecting that because they know that the, the three to five year notes are coming due and, and they got to you know, refinance at a much higher rate. And so it's interesting where whenever there's a big real estate or economic crisis, it's never what everyone's expecting. And since everyone's been expecting this, people are already starting to plan and work out loans or raise more equity or whatever it might be. Um, so what are you seeing on the ground today in both Florida and New York City? Are, are you actually seeing major distress manifest in multifamily where people are having to sell at a huge discount or getting foreclosed on? Anything like that anywhere you're doing business? Honestly, you know, I I have not seen this like real distress like that cross my desk as an opportunity. What I have seen is is you know within my network is people evaluating what to do, people hesitating on 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 kind of you know what strategy to deploy within their own situation, and I think that that is enough for me to gauge. Well, here's people that have been doing it for twenty years plus. Here's people that were on top of the world a couple of years ago, and they're having these conversations. It leads me to believe that there's a lot of these conversations happening that I'm not seeing, obviously. I have not seen distressed deals come across my desk 
for purchase. Um, like a lot of the people that I'm, you know, uh, and more involved in, in bankruptcy and all kinds of things are saying because of their position. I think they're, you know, they're a little more in it, in the trenches with it, but it's definitely happening. And, uh, if you're in the right group of, of, uh, in the right circle, you know, you're definitely going to be privy to those opportunities. And I think now is the time. Although I was, I was just told by a friend of mine that this is only the beginning. Everybody's saying, oh, this is the bottom. I, I don't think it's the bottom yet either. I think that this is the beginning and the bottom is yet to come for, in particular, multifamily. Yeah, and it, it's hard to say what's going to happen because there's been so much capital sitting on the sidelines for a while with all these people saying the bottom is going to come. So I think uh, there's a lot of people that will hear you say that and get very excited that um, the distressed sales might start coming in the next year or two. But uh, none of us have the crystal ball to be able to say kind of yeah. you know, what, what what's really, really going to happen. And if you're investing uh, in great locations where there is demand and the laws allow it to be feasible and it pencils out on a pro forma and you set your you know, debt and equity, your capital stack up appropriately. Uh, there's, there's a lot of risk mitigation that can be, that can be done in it. Um, and that's, what's fun about this business. If you do it right, you, for the most part, despite market conditions can succeed. But Chris, as we start kind of moving towards the end, uh, where do you see the CS organization moving? You've been in business for, for a while now, and we're, we're all young. We're all right around the same age of, uh, you know, late twenties. And, um, where do you see your thirties taking the CS organization? Uh, it's super exciting, and I love the question. I I see, I you know, I see this. And number one, I see myself growing, and I see the firm uh, growing rapidly as well. Right now, we're bringing on brokerage team members on the debt side and on the sales and leasing side. Um, we got a strong team in place, and we're and we're definitely looking for more. And I think that volume also on on you know, kind of where we are on the market is also giving some. Uh, benefit there as well so we you know we expect to continue to grow uh you know nimbly we don't want to be too large either but i feel good about it and i feel confident about it oh yeah no it, it, it's cool to watch your journey and it's uh fun seeing and making connections on linkedin that amount to uh getting to know people in real life and that's truly the value of networking of um, a lot of people that I've met in the Northeast know who you are and know who various connections that Dan and I made out there are. And, uh, that that's the beauty of being able to have people come on the show and chat through chat through our businesses. But Chris, uh, if people want to connect with you and figure out more about the CS organization, learn more about you, where can they go? Where can they find you? Instagram, LinkedIn, and our website. I'd be happy to meet all Perfect. We'll make sure to put all the links for all of your websites and social media contacts in the show notes of this episode. But before we get out of here, Chris, is are there any questions that you wish we had asked you that we did not ask you? Not that I could think of. I think, Look at that. I think we covered everything. And I think that the tone going forward should be let's sharpen the pencils. And let's and let's really evaluate the next couple of months. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity, and hopefully, opportunity for all of us to work together as well. Awesome. All right. Great. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for coming on the show. Uh, this is Mason McDonald and Dan Habercost with the Big Picture Blueprint signing off.